Switzerland before moving to the United States to do some postgraduate training in more basic science. So that puts the positions mobile very well for what we talk about a lot these days, which is translational science and understanding how to move uh, discovery from the bench into the clinic and back. Um, he went to Mass General to postdoc for four years, then went to NYU, University of Chicago, and in 2005, uh, ended up at Johns Hopkins, where, um, is, and that's where he's coming from today. And since he's been in the U.S., mabu has been working on pancreatic islets, um, and that's what he's going to talk about today. So with that, he'll give you a little more of his background. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sitting the bar high. <coughs> okay, so um, this is a uh, research seminar, but This is a research seminar, and uh, I would like to encourage you to, if you have questions, just interrupt. Um, and, um, so the title is uh, The Convergence of Incremental Signaling in Beta Cells and Novel Drug Targets for Diabetes mellitus. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction. We'll, talk about diabetes mellitus epidemiology in Malaysia. The information, the source of information that I have is from the OECD. And um, this, uh, the information that I have is, uh, was taken from the OECD sources before I arrived in Malaysia and how I'll tell you a little bit what my thinking is after I've been here for a few days, uh, how accurate I think these data are. And then um, I'll, I'll touch briefly on incretin hormone physiology so that, uh, uh, and pharmacology so that uh, we know what happens afterwards because we then I'm going to present a little bit of, uh, of my research at, uh, at Johns Hopkins about how intracellular incretin signaling is mediated in beta cells and some of the novel findings uh, in beta cells. And then at the end, um, I will touch on over a, a couple of the uh, hot topics in, in diabetes currently, uh, about what are the what are the uh, aspects of diabetes that are, that are not well understood? Is there related to metabolism? And I added some points here to uh, see if there would be a way of uh, finding uh, a connection between this, the work that we've been doing uh, in, in the states some groups here. The microphone's not working. What? You burn the fuse out? This is working. All right, so um, um, the diabetes prevalence worldwide is increasing. And um, in Malaysia, the, the, the data that you get is quite variable. You can get between 8% and 14% of the population is, uh, is supposedly diabetic. And um, I suspect after being here for uh, for for, uh, for a few for a few days, I think this month th even this number might be a little lower. Um, in the U.S., it's 
10 to 13 percent of the population according to the Center of Disease Control, and that is probably also a little low. And diabetes is ranked as number three to four as causes of, of death in Malaysia. If you look at the uh, prevalence of type 2 diabetes, um, and you compare Korea with Malaysia here, the U.S. is over here, then you can see that the uh, prevalence maybe is about the same, probably a little bit higher in Malaysia, probably a little bit higher than Korea, just because of the way they report the diseases. And if you look at the, uh, um, the, the projected increase in the prevalence of diabetes, then you're seeing here, according to the OECD uh, website, that Korea is the area, is the, is the country with the fastest growing diabetes incidence that is projected in the next approximately five years. And uh, Malaysia is down here, still faster than the U.S., but uh, um, <clears throat> I suspect that this number is a little bit too low. So it is a, uh, it is a significant health problem, and it's probably a growing significant health problem, and not something that is uh, going away anytime soon. Um, Diabetes in East Asia is not as strongly associated with obesity as in the U.S. And in Malaysia, uh, the, the numbers that are reported is 5% obese and 27% are overweight. But there's a difference here. Overweight is not yet uh, associated with uh, disease, where obesity is associated with risk of disease. And in the U.S., 34% of the population are obese and 30% are overweight. So. More than half of the people are actually overweight or even worse. Um, in, the, uh, in Malaysia, it's been 30% of the population is overweight or beyond that. And there's less association of diabetes mellitus with obesity related to insulin resistance in Malaysia and other East Asian countries. Um, and most of the reason, the, the main reason for this association is that the manifestation of type 2 diabetes in East Asia is uh, thought to be due to a a beta cell defect that occurs much earlier in, uh, in, uh, in, in East Asian populations. In, in, uh, for example, in Japan, the, uh, uh, the average uh, capacity of, 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 of the beta cells to secrete insulin compared to a, a Caucasian counterpart in, uh, in the U.S. is about 50 percent. So for any, for any load of sugar that uh, that the um, uh, <coughs> that, that that a person gets, a Japanese person can maximally secrete about 50% insulin as compared to a to, to a person um, in the U.S. So there definitely is a, a, a large difference between um, the ability of beta cells to respond at a maximum rate to uh, to metabolic demands. The um, other <clears throat> factor that comes in here in terms of who is over, how is overweight and obesity defined, there actually is a, 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 a definition for obesity which is different in East Asia than in, um, than, than in the Western Hemisphere. And if that adjustment is made, then suddenly um, more people in Malaysia or in East Asia are actually fall into this category of obesity. So, uh, uh, you know, this is a body mass index and the way you calculate it. The calculation stays the same, but the cutoff numbers are changed and reduced to define obesity <coughs> in East Asia. So essentially we have um, a disease that is uh, a combination of increased insulin demand, insulin resistance, especially in the liver and in the skeletal muscle. And there's a relative reduction of insulin secretion in type 2 diabetes. So type 2 diabetes is, is a combination of these two factors. And this relative reduction of insulin secretion can be due to a reduction in beta cell mass or a, or a functional beta cell failure. And um, so the thinking today is that the uh, insulin resistance might occur sooner at lower body mass index in East Asia and that the insulin secretion capacity, the functional beta cell failure occurs sooner 
in East Asian populations. And this is probably the factor that is more responsible for the increasing incidence of type 2 diabetes in, uh, <coughs> in East Asia and in Malaysia. Um, so type 2 diabetes treatment is done essentially by, um, uh, by addressing two things. One is the increased insulin demand or insulin resistance. So the treatment there is metformin that works mainly in, in the liver and thiazolidinediones that is a class of drugs that works mainly in, uh, in, in peripheral tissues and in skeletal muscle. The uh, other avenue is of treatment is to increase insulin secretion. So you have the insulin resistant tissues and then the insulin secreting tissues, the beta cell, to address beta cell failure or reduction in mass. The treatment there are sulfonylurea receptor activators, insulin itself as a replacement, incretin, incretin hormones, and we'll discuss that, and uh, DPP4 inhibitors are essentially inhibitors that uh, keep the endogenous incretin that are secreted uh, from being degraded. This, this enzyme uh, degrades incretin, so if you inhibit this, uh, if you inhibit EPP4, you increase the half-life of incretin in the circulation. Um, <clears throat> just to show you a little bit about the uh, reduction in beta cell mass in, in type 2 diabetics, people with type 2 diabetics have 35 to 50 percent less beta cells. Um, it's not quite clear at this point whether this is a primary defect of uh, a result of development, whether people who go on to become type 2 diabetics are born with less beta cells, or whether this beta cell reduction, this reduction in beta cell mass is secondary due to a loss of beta cells during lifetime. <coughs> Most of the trend right now, thinking right now, is that this is a primary defect that some people are just born with more beta cells, some people are born with le uh, less beta cells, and the ones who have less beta cells um, are prone to becoming diabetic once they start becoming insulin resistant. If we look at the functional beta cell failure, there's something quite interesting and remarkable. Patients with type 2 diabetes and subjects at risk of developing type 2 diabetes show an early reduction in first phase insulin secretion. So what is this first phase insulin secretion? If you take a normal person and, um, or, a, or, or you compare two groups of people, one is diabetic and one is not diabetic but has the same degree of obesity. What you see here is when glucose is administered to these people, then there's a, in the normal case, there's a first phase of insulin that surges in the blood and then is followed by a second phase of insulin secretion. If you look at a type 2 diabetic person, their baseline, glucose, uh, baseline insulin levels are about the same. But when you stimulate them with glucose, this first phase is absolutely gone. And there is a second phase. Some studies, the second phase is actually the, uh, has the same uh, degree of elevation as, as, as in the normals, but this first phase is remarkably, remarkably gone. And the interesting thing is that even subjects uh, who are going on to become type 2 diabetics will have a deficiency in this. So this is what we got interested in in my lab a, a, a few years ago. Um, primarily because there's this observation that if you restore first phase insulin, this increases improves glucose control in glycemia in type 2 diabetics. So if you uh, take um, type 2 diabetics and give them a um, infusion of insulin so that this peak gets restored, their glucose metabolism improves dramatically. <coughs> now there is a, uh, there's, a, there's this incretin hormone analog the incretin hormone we're talking about is glucagon-like peptide 1. And I'll show you a little bit about that. And there's an analog for that, a long-acting analog called Xenin-4. This uh, Xenin-4 was actually isolated originally from, uh, from, the, uh, from the salivary glands of the, uh, of the Gila monster. And uh, GLP-1 was isolated in the laboratory at the Massachusetts General Hospital where I did my postdocs. This is uh, where, where I get all this information from. 
So it restores, so, so GLP-1 treatment in humans is done, in type 2 diabetics is done, and interestingly enough, it restores the first phase of insulin secretion. So these are patients who are controls, and then you have type 2 diabetics in the dark curve that were treated with Bieda, that's the extended form. This first phase of insulin secretion is restored, and the second phase of insulin secretion is also augmented. Um, another observation that actually came from China is that intensive insulin treatment in newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes restores first phase insulin secretion. So the beta cell defect can be reversed if, uh, if the patients are treated early and very, very intensively. And this was an interesting study. It changed a lot of the thinking in the field because um, these patients who were type 2 diabetics diagnosed, newly diagnosed, when they were treated with in intensive insulin uh, therapy, they became, not only did their first phase of insulin secretion come back, but, but some of them were, uh, did not need any treatment at all for up to two months, two years. So they were essentially, their type 2 diabetes was uh, removed, and uh, they did not need any treatment at all until they got worse again, and, and uh, some of them lasted for two years, some of them lasted for four months. Um, another observation is patients undergoing bariatric surgery improve beta cell function well before weight loss. So this is a, a surgical procedure that is, that is used to, uh, to address uh, um, overweight or obesity, but those patients who actually have diabetes, if they are subjected to the surgery and they, their beta cell function improves, their diabetes improves even before they lose weight. So there's something uh, that uh, seems to change in these patients, and what these patients also show is uh, increased levels of glucagon-like peptide 1 uh, in their blood after surgery, especially after meals. So what is this Ingrid hormone system? The Ingrid hormone, there are two primary Ingrid hormones. They are, uh, one is called GIP, gastric inhibitory peptide, and the other one is called glucagon-like peptide 1. And they are secreted from specialized endocrine cells in the intestine. So when food comes into the intestine, especially amino acids and glucose, uh, there are specialized cells, K cells and L cells in the intestine. They secrete in response to glucose or, or amino acids, uh, these ingredient hormones. They enter the blood system and they reach the pancreas. They reach the beta cell and the alpha cells. They stimulate the beta cells to secrete insulin, they in inhibit the alpha cells from secreting glucagon. And this insulin reaches the liver and controls um, hepatic glucose output. Um, and the interesting thing is that if you infuse glucose into the vein of a human being, or if you give a human being oral glucose as a drink, and you mimic the excursion of glucose in the bloodstream. So both, uh, both oral and intravenous glucose is uh, causing the same excursion of glucose, same rise of glucose and same decrease of glucose. If you look at the person who gets the glucose orally, the insulin secretion is much higher, about, about three times higher than the person who gets the insulin infusion through the vein. So the oral glucose administration that stimulates the insulin response increases the insulin response from the beta cell. And this is called the impotent effect. This is biologically called the impotent effect. This happens in all of us. If we, if we drink glucose, we secrete insulin. And if we would take the glucose through the vein, we would secrete less insulin. So, <clears throat> these patients with type 2 diabetes have a lack of first phase insulin secretion, and this GLP-1 or extended 4 restores the first phase insulin secretion. Um, there have been some uh, studies in, uh, in rodents, in mice and rats, that show that GLP-1 and extended 4 stimulate beta cell proliferation, but in humans that does not really happen. And so how does GLP-1 augment this glucose-stimulated insulin secretion? And what goes wrong in diabetic pilots 
that can be positively influenced by GLP-1 glycemic care. And the remarkable thing is that um, incretin therapy, semi 4 works in literally every type 2 diabetic. There's hardly ever a failure. So this is an um, interesting uh, phenomenon. This drug therapy is an interesting phenomenon to use as a tool to investigate the, the, the restoration of the first phase insulin secretion that's gone. So we use this as a tool in the lab. And if you look at the incretin signaling in the, in, the, in the beta cell, this is the beta cell. This is the GLP-1 receptor. And the GLP-1 receptor is a seven transmembrane receptor that's coupled to G proteins. And it's a, a G alpha S coupled protein. So it stimulates adenyl cycles to make something AP in the beta cell. And it has some other signaling pathways that also get activated, which are considered to um, influence gene, gene expression in, in the nucleus of the beta cell. And so, you know, a, a cyclic AMP is the second messenger of GLP-1 infection. There is a, um, after the, after cyclic AMP, there seem to be two branches of signaling. One goes through protein kinase A, and one through a protein called EPAC, or exchange protein activated by cyclic AMP. And this is the protein that this is the arm that is thought, has been thought to increase the insulin secretion in beta cells in response to GLP-1. So we have the GLP-1 receptor, we have the second messenger, cyclic AP, and distal downstream of cyclic AP, we have protein kinase A, we have EPAC-2, and they both somehow signal to increased insulin secretion. Both seem to be important. How they interact is not so far being, so far being known. Um, the other interesting thing is that even if GLP-1 is working, the beta cell will not secrete insulin unless glucose levels rise. So there's a dependency on glucose. Uh, there's a dependency on glucose levels to increase so that the effects of GLP-1 can be, can be manifest. If glucose levels are low, GLP-1 will not work. So this is also a drug that does not cause hypoglycemia type 2 diabetes. So <clears throat> what, how do these interact? And how does this whole system um, uh, be dependent on, on glucose levels in, in, uh, in the circulation? There have been, um, there have been uh, um, mice that have had a knockout of PKA. There have been some, some uh, experiments done where the protein kinase A has been inhibited by, uh, by pharmacological maneuvers. But the target of PKA, where the signal goes to, um, was not known before we started looking at this a little bit earlier, uh, earlier uh, uh, last year. So there are mice that don't have EPAC2. And surprisingly enough, they have normal glucose tolerance when the glucose is given orally. So they seem to have a normal insulin uh, secretion response and uh, in response to impotence. But they do have an impaired sulfonylurea action. So it looks like that this EPAC2 somehow is involved in the, uh, in the effects of sulfonylurea, some other drugs that work on the, uh, on the pancreatic beta cells. But these mice have impaired incretin potentiation of glucostimulating insulin secretion. So if you give them incretin exogenously, their insulin secretion is uh, Impaired. So let's look at uh, let's look at uh, the exocytosis machinery. We have GLP-1 receptor signaling to cyclic AP, and there must be some downstream factor that is a target of protein kinase A, and there must be some way of converging the protein kinase A and the EPAC2 signaling down to somewhere where uh, that facilitates insulin secretion. Um, I think this is an animated thing. So GLP-1 binds to its receptor, and once it's bound, it will stimulate adenyl cyclase. Adenyl cyclase will get activated and uh, synthesize cyclic AMP from ATP. The cyclic AMP goes to the PKA holoenzyme which is inactive, it, it, it is a complex of uh, 
catalytic subunit and regulatory subunits. And the regulatory subunits bind to the catalytic subunit and keep it from being active. But when cyclic NP binds to the um, catalytic uh, regulatory subunit, it releases the catalytic subunit and makes the protein kinase A active. And then protein kinase A is released and can essentially uh, function as, a, as an enzyme. So cyclic NP releases the catalytic subunits from the regulatory subunits. So what we did is to try to investigate what the effects are of the catalytic subunit in the, uh, in the, in the beta cell. We generated a mouse that uh, lacks the regulatory subunit, one alpha. So there are four regulatory subunits and we knocked out in a mouse the uh, regulatory subunit one alpha that uh, is the highest expressed regulatory subunit in beta cells. So we took a mouse that has um, blocked R1 alpha and we crossed it with a mouse that expresses Cre recombinase in the uh, pancreas and the offspring of these mice have no R1 alpha in the pancreas. And this is a western blot showing that R1 alpha indeed is missing uh, in, in the islets of these mice, and CREB, which is a transcription factor that is known to be a target of, of, uh, of, of PKA, is phosphorylated. So the mice are doing what we expect them to do. They lack R1 alpha, and the PKA activity is elevated. You can see here the PKA phosphor phosphorylated CREB is increased, R1 alpha is decreased. We look at uh, <coughs> glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. So this is, uh, these are mice that would receive intraperitoneal glucose. And what you see here are control mice that have a glucose excursion that is the, the normal excursion that we expect. And the mice that lack R1-alpha, they have this very super sensitive glucose tolerance. Um, they don't have any problems with uh, responding to insulin and their their, uh, their response to insulin in the periphery is normal. But when we look at insulin secretion, they have the same amount of insulin in their, in their blood at baseline, but when they are stimulated with glucose at this point here, their insulin levels rise about tenfold more than, uh, than the control mice. So this, is, this actually says that there is a tremendous reserve in beta cells to secrete insulin, ten times more than uh, than if the R1 alpha would not be there. Um, what we thought at that time was that the beta cell mass might have increased. And when we looked at that, beta cell mass was not increased. Beta cell number, pancreas weight, um, beta cell area, islet area, everything stayed the same. And when we stimulate these islets in vitro, when we take out these islets, put them in culture, and stimulate them with glucose, they're again still secreting more insulin. Um, they don't have more insulin in as a, in per islet. So it's not that they're making more insulin, but they're secreting more insulin. And they're not making, they're not secreting more insulin if the glucose levels are low. They only do that if the glucose levels are high. Um, <coughs> Now, what's happening if we, what happens if we give these animals glucose uh, through the oral route into their intestine? Does the incretin system still work? And uh, how effective is the incretin system? So these are, these are mice that are control mice, their glucose levels. And this is now glucose given orally to these mice. So they swallow the glucose, it goes to the intestine. The knockouts have, still have the same improved glucose tolerance, and the, the ones, the, the mice that have only one allele of the, uh, of the R1, R1 alpha, they're somewhere in the middle. So they also have, uh, they have improved insulin secretion, as you see here. So they still have a maintained insulin uh, response. It's just, it, it, it's just half as, you know, it's just twice as much essentially because they have, they lack one, one allele. And we can replicate this, this in vivo experiment in the mouse in isolated islets. If we, if we treat these islets with uh, extended 4 and look at their glucose-stimulated uh, insulin secretion, it's maximum in the, in the mice that 
lack the uh, one alpha completely. And uh, but there's still there's there's some response to extending four in the mice that are heterozygous for one alpha. So the incretin axis is still functional, um, but it's it's maximally stimulated in the mice that lack one alpha, where extending four has no is no longer um, uh, increasing the insulin secretion. So it seems to be maxed out when one alpha is missing. We do, there are patients who have a mutation, an inactivating mutation in R1 alpha. So there are human beings that don't have, that have one allele that is mutated, so that it's not working, and the other allele is, is, uh, is, is a wild type. So these humans are actually like uh, the heterozygotes here, like these and like these. And obviously we can't take out their eyelids and look at them, but we can do oral glucose tolerance tests in these humans. And what we see here is that they actually do have an improved glucose tolerance as compared to the folks. So their insulin secretion is higher and their glucose tolerance is better. And these patients, ultimately, the, the R1 alpha is actually, uh, there's a disease called the Carney's complex. So they, they develop other problems in, in their life. And we use these, uh, use these patients to analyze the axis in the, uh, in the insulin secretion. So, in summary, we have <clears throat> right now, in, in, in intermediate summary, we have that if we take out one alpha, we have increased insulin secretion, unchanged basal insulin secretion, and no change in hydric mass. So what is, the, what is the target of PKA, and what is, how do PKA, how does this target and the EPAC signal um, interact, and how does this all still depend on the glucose level? So the, when we do an, uh, the clue we got is when we did an electron microscopy of the pancreatic islets of these mice. So these are the knockout mice, and these are uh, control mice. And I just want to show you here, in the knockout mice, you can see that these, these vesicles here, these are the vesicles that contain insulin in the beta cells. And um, these vesicles are lined up against the capillary. In, in the control mice, there are not as many vesicles lined up along the capillaries as in the knockout mm -hmm. mice. So somehow there's more, somehow the signaling causing more of these vesicles to line up against the capillaries. And these vesicles are also bigger. If you look at the, if you look at the vesicle size, they're, they're in average bigger in the knockout mice than in the control mice. And there are many more uh, vesicles adjacent to the capillary than in the control animal. So we essentially looked for, we start, this, this, uh, this experiment indicated that we have to look somewhere in the apparatus that allows the insulin secretion or insulin vesicles to, uh, to, uh, to be secreted. And um, I just want to show you in a schematic, what is known is that, that uh, insulin uh, is, uh, is in a vesicle and there are proteins that are associated to this vesicle and there are proteins that are associated to the cell membrane and uh, one protein is called SNAP25 and one protein here is called VAMP2 and these two together plus syntaxin they, they form a so-called snare complex and this snare complex is used universally in, in, in many cells in the body for uh, to regulate secretion um, when a signal is given, usually calcium, then somehow the NP2 and SNAP25 fuse together and bring this insulin vesicle to the cell membrane where insulin is, is exocytose out of the, uh, out of the cell. <coughs> so we looked for, uh, we actually did an in situ candidate approach for uh, proteins that are associated with the sphere complex and our PKA response. And we, Multi we searched multiple databases and we came up with this protein called SNAPIN. And so the, uh, the mechanism how SNAPIN was shown to work in the nervous system is that it is PK responsive um, in, in neuronal tissues. It, is, it was already, had already been described in pancreatic beta cells and, had, and with association with cholecterin and, and this new complex SNAP25. And it was, uh, we also found in other 
particles that snap and is enriched in islets four to ten times as compared to exocrine tissues. And the sequence of snapping is more than 95% identical between mouse and humans. So there were there were some uh, there was some literature available indicating that this might be the candidate protein that would fulfill these criteria. It would be PK responsive. It may it should mimic the incretin effects in the wild type situation. Um, it should uh, allow um, the the observation that incretin effects in diabetes rapidly improve glucose stimulated insulin secretion, and that it would have possible association with exocytose machinery. So these are the criteria that this protein would have to fulfill. So first we looked at this snapping present in beta cells. And I don't know if you can see this picture well in this light, but um, what you see in this um, bottom photomicrograph essentially is uh, insulin staining and snapping staining here where if you take a non-specific antibody that does not in, uh, detect SNAP, you don't see anything. And you have here insulin, insulin, in this specific serum, you have SNAP. And when you overlay these pictures, they come together, <coughs> indicating that SNAP is uh, co-localized with insulin. And uh, four, five, and six are, uh, these are, the four and five are insulinoma cells, and six are mouse islets. And you can see that SNAP is present in mouse islets and insulinoma cells, but not in control cells. So we have this candidate protein SNAPIN. And does this SNAPIN get phosphorylated? So we stimulate mouse islets and human islets with XN4 with the uh, incretin hormone. And we see that SNAPIN gets phosphorylated in both systems. And if we inhibit PK activity by inhibiting a pharma, by using a pharmacologic inhibitor, we can make this phosphorylation go away. So this phosphorylation is responsive to XNN4 and is, uh, can be inhibited by, by an inhibitor of PK. If we block this pathway, this phosphorylation does not happen. So this first criteria is fulfilled. This is the inhibitor that we use. It's Mercilin PKI that directly inhibits PK activity. And if we do that, we do not get phosphorylation. If we stimulate um, islets with a, uh, with, with a pharmacologic agent that directly stimulates EPAC2, we do not get phosphorylation. So this is the pathway that probably is active in beta cells to phosphorylate PKA, uh, to snap it. And this is a uh, very busy slide. <coughs> but what we, what, uh, what, what we can see here is that if we stimulate uh, cells with low or high glucose, so low glucose or high glucose, low, high, low, high, low, high. Um, regardless of the glucose levels, if we stimulate with extended 4, we can increase the phosphorylation of SNAP. And if we inhibit with PKI, this phosphorylation of SNAP goes away. But what is remarkable is that if we stimulate with extended 4 and increased glucose, then suddenly we have in the complex that we're looking at, we have BAMP2. And that is the protein that's at the insulin vesicle, that's not at the cell membrane. So this phosphorylation increases the interaction with, uh, with uh, uh, SNAP25, um, but it only allows interaction with BAMP2 if glucose levels are high. So in these mice, if we go back and look at these mice that we had created, which lack the PK regulatory subunit, if we look at this snapping phosphorylated, there's higher phosphorylation in snapping, and there's more interaction with SNAP25, but there's no, not more interaction uh, with, uh, there's, there's some more interaction with EPAC2 as well. So we're kind of trying to dissect this, uh, this, uh, this complex here, and again, you can see here in the larger in the larger image, this interaction with VAMP2 over here that's at the insulin vesicle only occurs if glucose levels are high. So there is some dependency on glucose to bring these two together, but there is definitely a dependency of SNAP and phosphorylation to bring EPAC2 and SNAP25. So when we increase glucose, we know that in glucose increases calcium in beta cells. 
And this seems to uh, trigger the fusion of this part of the snare complex and the insulin vesicle with this part of the complex that then results in exocytosis. So we have the dependency on glucose and we have the uh, PKA target in beta cells. And this again shows the mice that we first started off with. If we increase the glucose in these islets, suddenly we see the fusion with the, with the association of VAMP2 in this complex here. The glucose levels are kept low. This association does not happen. So this explains why <coughs> GLP-1 signaling does not work at low glucose levels. It only works when glucose levels are high. And though there's prevention from hypoglycemia through the encrypted system um, in, in the body. This is a uh, very complicated slide, but I'd just like to show you that what we did is we had mutated this snapping at a site that is phosphorylated by PKA at serine 50. We, we mutated with, uh, by, with uh, replacing the serine with an alanine or replacing the serine with an aspartate. Uh, the alanine makes this snapping dead. It cannot be phosphorylated by PKA and there's no binding to any protein. If we replace the serine 50 with aspartate, it essentially mimics the phosphorylation. It, it adds a negative charge to the, to the snapping, to the serine 50. And because of this introduction of a negative charge, uh, the, the snapping acts as if it is phosphorylated already. And if we do that, we can see that whether it, glucose levels are high or low, it's, it interacts with the, uh, with the other protein members, SNAP25, collectin, and type 2 And only in, uh, under high glucose levels does it interact, allow interaction with BMP2. So this interaction with BMP2 is strictly uh, dependent on glucose. The interaction with the other proteins is strictly dependent on phosphorylation of SNAP and on serine 50. <clears throat> now we took, uh, in, this, in this experiment, I apologize for the bad quality of the picture, some has to do with the resolution um, of the camera, of the projector. The, um, what we did is we made adenovirus and we infected virus with, uh, with, uh, with the snapin, with a control virus or with a virus that expresses snapin that is mutated to mimic the phosphorylation. And what we do here is we take islets in culture from a mouse and we keep it in culture and then we increase the glucose levels from three to 10 millimolar. And um, what this does is it stimulates, when we increase the glucose levels, it stimulates insulin secretion. We can follow the first phase and the second phase. And this is a control islet here, where we see first and second phase. And we can see if we take a control virus, we can see first and second phase as well. If we, st <coughs> if we stimulate the islet with extending four, with the encryption analog, and we can see first phase and second phase. And if we overexpress the snapping that mimics the phosphor snapping, we can again see the first phase and the second phase. So this essentially uh, means that mimicking the serine 50 phosphorylation and snapping essentially confers the incretin like effects on the glucostimulant insulin secretion. If we remove snapping from the beta cells by knockdown, we can essentially obliterate insulin secretion. So this essentially means that, uh, this finding means that snapping seems to be important and critical for insulin secretion to occur at all, whether it's uh, incretin mediated or not. And this is uh, essentially a similar finding, just a bit more complicated. Now, <clears throat> the last question that remains, is so we have, we have the incretin signaling, we have the glucose dependency, we know how PKA um, signaling and EPAC2 signaling come together because they bind together. SNAP25, EPAC2, snapping are all in the same complex. And we also know that uh, calcium is required for the glucose dependency of, of uh, association with BAP2. Uh, so now the last question is <clears throat> what goes wrong in type 2 diabetes in the islands? So for that, I'd like to introduce to you something, it's, it's the hexosamine biosynthesis pathway. Glucose usually goes into the cell and gets metabolized down the uh, glycolytic pathway. But if you, have, um, if, if you have a situation where you have an abundance of fatty acids, 
uh, fatty acid acyl coenzyme A, they can inhibit, or certain products of this, they can inhibit gly the glycolytic pathway. And in, in certain circumstances, like in diabetes, this results in more flux of glucose through a pathway that is um, that involves glucosamine. And um, essentially, uh, glucosamine can then post-translationally modify proteins with a glycosylation group at an amino acid. Usually it's a serine or a 3 -union. And this enzyme, O-glycnac transferase and o ase these um, these, these uh, enzymes are highly expressed in beta cells. So there's an enzymatic attachment of acyl glucosamine at serine and serine residues of proteins. And oblic inoculation is increased in diabetes mellitus. That's, that's been known in, in all tissues. Um, and oblic inoculation is increased in diabetic rat pilots. And if you reverse the oblic inoculation in rat pilots, um, it improves glucose stimulating insulin secretion. So here we essentially Based on these findings, we uh, tested a hypothesis that does snapping get glycnaculated, or any protein, or does any protein in the pathway that we've just described get glycnaculated and does impair glucose stimulated insulin secretion? So here we took mice that were made diabetic. We gave them a high fat diet for six weeks. And when we look at these, uh, uh, mice that are diabetic, we have high glucose levels as compared to the ones that got normal diet. And if we look at the insulin secretion, their insulin secretion is not sufficient to keep their glucose down. They're, they're, they're impaired. Their insulin secretion is not higher. So these, uh, these high fat diet mice are now diabetic. And if we look at their snap-in phosphorylation, is is the controls, this is the diabetic islets, snapping phosphorylation is reduced. If we check for oblic inoculation, we see that snapping oblic inoculation is elevated. SNAP25 binding to snapping is reduced, and so is cholesterol. Um, if we look at where does snapping get phosphorylated, we introduce these mutants into these islets and check for serine phosphorylation or oblic inoculation then what we find is that if we mutate the serine 50 to the alanine or aspartate, the phosphorylation goes away, and so does the glycnaculation. So essentially, this serine 50 is either phosphorylated in diabetic islets, in islets or glycnaculated in, in, in diabetic islets. The same serine is, can either be phosphorylated or glycnaculated. So we have this uh, situation where um, snapping at serine 50, it can be phosphorylated by protein kinase A and infancy the link, and can be glycnaculated in, in a diabetic situation. And the question here then becomes, what happens if we take a diabetic islet, and which has a lot of glycnaculated snapping, and you treat with extending 4 the ex expectation would be that this glycnaculation should be reversed, and this phosphorylation should be and what we see here is actually quite remarkable. Within minutes of extending four treatment, you can see that the phosphoserine of snapping increases and the glycnaculation here, this part, goes away. So the extending four treatment here can actually reverse this glycnaculation and increase the, the proportion of snapping that gets phosphorylated. And so now we have the question, does this does this actually translate into improved glucose stimulated insulin secretion in beta cells? And you can see that here. If we introduce the mutant that mimics the phosphorylation, so this mutant is immune against glycnaculation, but it acts as if it's phosphorylated. If we introduce that into beta cells with type 2 diabetic islets, the same islets of those, of the, the, the same mice that we looked at before, we can see first phase is missing here. There is a second phase, but it's all impaired. If we treat them with extending four, you can see first phase comes up, and, extending, and the second phase is augmented. And if we introduce the virus that expresses the mutant S50, it's D, and you can see first phase come back, and the second phase is elevated. So this, this uh, phenomenon of, of removing the glycnaculation and increasing the proportion of phosphorylation also 
uh, restores the first phase of the secretion in diabetic patients. <coughs> so we continue some experiments. These are these are uh, uh, so these are mice that have the uh, mutation, the knockout mice, and we put these mice on a high fat diet. Question is, are they going to be protected from diabetes? Or we put them on a normal diet. And what we find here is quite amazing. We find that the uh, glucose tolerance is impaired in the wild type mice and in the heterozygous mice, but in the knockout mice, the glucose tolerance is essentially, um, is essentially maintained normal. So the PKA, the, reg the mice that lack the regulatory subunit, where the snapping is always phosphorylated, uh, they don't become diabetic like the ones that would, uh, the control mice that were put on high fat diet. These are the control, uh, this is the control experiment with the normal diet. You see that the glucose excursions are not as high. The high fat diet mice are heavily impaired whereas the normal diet, they don't, they don't have that high level of glucose. Their baseline glucose levels are also higher in the high fat diet, whereas the baseline glucose levels in the S50 and the PKA mice remain normal. They remain unchanged. <coughs> when we look at fasting glucose levels in these mice, we can see that the normal diet mice have uh, have their, their, their fasting glucose levels are about as high. The, the di diabetes induced obesity mice, the diabetic mice, their fasting glucose levels are elevated. If we look at the knockout mice, then normal diet or diet or high fat diet, the glucose levels are slightly elevated but not significant. So they just, they just, uh, they're fully protected from, from diabetes. Um, we also looked at, uh, we also gave these animals pyruvate uh, in, in, into their peritoneum. And pyruvate essentially is a substrate that feeds into gluconeogenesis. And, and, uh, and if, if in diabetes, what you have is that if you increase, uh, if, you, if you supply pyruvate to a diabetic animal or to a human, the uh, glucose levels go up. And it's just like a glucose tolerance, it's just like as if you were giving them uh, a, a bonus of glucose. Pyruvate gets rapidly converted into glucose. Um, but this is what happens in the knockout mice. So these are the mice that have been on high fat diet. 60% uh, of their diet is from high fat for six weeks. And if you give them pyruvate, flat line, that pyruvate does not get converted into, uh, into glucose. Or actually, these are the control experiments. These are the high fat batteries. Still, there's hardly any any effect of pyruvate as opposed to the uh, to the, to the, to the coma. So the conclusions are that snapping is a clear complex associated protein and target of of, uh, of PKA PKA phosphorylated snapping at serum 50. Snapping mediates PKA dependent effects of hormones. And the phosphorylation increases association of snapping, collecting, actin, and snapping. This forms a complex of the cell membrane. And glucose then is required for the complex associated with VNP2 to initiate the final calcium dependent exocytosis. Um, and in diabetic islets, uh, snapping S50 is oblique inoculated. And this oblique inoculation is rapidly reversed by, uh, by SN4 replaced with phosphorylation. And the SNAP in S50D mutant mimics extending force stimulated S50 phosphorylation and restores first phase insulin secretion. And um, we have now a provisional patent application from Johns Hopkins uh, for novel drug targets for diabetes molecules, and that is uh, PRKR1-alpha uh, and SNAP in S50. Um, <coughs> so essentially, Snapping is required for insulin secretion. If we knock this protein out, we knock it down, then insulin never reaches the, uh, the, uh, the surface of the, of the cell and uh, it cannot be exercised to us. Um, this work was uh, funded by the National Institutes of Health. The work was done um, in my lab by Ujin, Madhav, Tembi, 
these are all, these two are, these three are students, these are th summer students that were in the lab just for two or three months. Um, and these are the, these are the postdocs and technician. Um, the clinical work was done at the National Institute of Health, and the clinical service, and the auto and alpha mice were made by Lawrence Kirchner. So at the end, I want to uh, <coughs> talk a little bit about the current hot topics in type 2 diabetes research. And uh, um, one hot topic is the beta cell, the other hot topic is the liver, and then there are two more that come on the next slide. And in the beta cell, the questions are, what are the mechanisms of loss of first phase insulin secretion? Is it always glick inactivation of snapping, or is it, or is it more than one mechanism? Um, how can they be predicted? Are there any bio biomarkers for loss of first phase insulin secretion? And these kind of things are important if you think about it. There is a, a group of people that uh, are very, very uh, vulnerable, and those are actually uh, pregnant women. And uh, they're, they're, uh, they're developing fetus and embryos. And if uh, it could be identified who of these uh, young women will become diabetic in their pregnancy, is there a biomarker that target population? If there was a way of identifying them easily, uh, uh, that target population could be treated very effectively. Uh, should people at risk be screened for defective course patients and secretion? Uh, who would that be, and what would be the consequences? So, you know, gestation diabetes might be a very good place to start. Um, are there pharmaceutical compounds that could selectively stimulate for space insulin secretion? Um, we don't know yet. There is no such compound. The incretin hormones actually stimulate both first and second phase. Um, is is there any drug that would do the first phase only? Uh, beta cell regeneration or proliferation? Will it work? how to achieve it. This is um, a current hot topic. Can we increase the amount of beta cells in, in patients who have type 2 diabetes and have reduced beta cell mass? If we look at the liver, is the question is, in, is increased gluconeogenesis present before diabetes, diabetes mellitus is diagnosed? That is, in humans, it's absolutely unclear if that actually happens. In humans, it's also unclear if increased gluconeogenesis is actually due to increased transcription of of gluconeogenic genes, or is this something that just happens in, in, in animal models that we've studied last? And another thing is, what is the molecular basis of fatty liver? And how does this stimulate gluconeogenesis and insulin resistance? The connection between fatty liver and gluconeogenesis and insulin resistance at the molecular level is not sorted out. Um, in the skeletal muscle, is uh, treating peripheral insulin resistance sufficient to reverse type 2 diabetes? Not quite known. Um, and are there myokines that influence substrate metabolism? Are there hormones that come out of the skeletal muscle that will affect substrate metabolism? So um, about 10 years ago, adipose tissue was thought to be just a storage facility for fat, but adipose tissue now is considered to be an endocrine or organ that stimulates at least a dozen, if not more, uh, adipokines that influence me metabolic processes in different tissues. And the same question goes for myokines, the same question goes for bone, essentially for osteoclast. In adipose tissue, are there additional adipokines influencing metabolism? And uh, actually there's a, uh, a, a Malaysian investigator at Hopkins who has identified a, a, a number of adipokines that hopefully will publish in the next near future. And is obesity really detrimental, or is it the inability to expand adipose storage really the problem? There's some hypothesis that if we could uh, if we could expand our adipose tissue indefinitely, we'd never get diabetic. And this goes back to the uh, uh, question about how to define obesity in, uh, in East Asian populations. Maybe they just don't have the ability to expand their adipose tissue as much as uh, as other populations do. <clears throat> and if they can't expand the adipose tissue, they run into insulin resistance much sooner. Um, questions in the brain are is how can food intake and satiety be influenced pharmacologically? Is there a therapeutic role for ghrelin, which is a hormone that comes from the pancreatic islets and is the only hormone that stimulates food intake? And if you could uh, antagonize this, could, could there something be achieved? Um, is there a therapeutic role for combination treatment? glucagon and GLP-1 together, and how do they work? And the intestine is, what is the molecular mechanism of how bariatric surgery is 
I just real recently. So to, uh, for some realistic aspects, where could collaborations be started maybe in a, a situation like we find here? Some uh, more clinically oriented work would be, um, should people be, at, should people be screened for defective first space and secretions or at risk? Would that have some consequences? Um, there might be some certain population groups where this might actually be meaningful. And are there pharmaceutical compounds or other compounds that would selectively stimulate for space and secretion? This could be fairly easily tested um, in the right setting with simple studies. Um, liver, um, the investigators that we're going to meet tomorrow might be able to participate in questions like this. Is increased gluconeogenesis present before diabetes is diagnosed? Maybe people who are, um, have metabolic syndrome or people who have fatty liver. And the same question in the same patients. Are actually gluconeogenic genes uh, upregulated in diabetics? Or is this just a change in enzymatic activity in such big drugs? I think that would be it. So what we are doing right now is we have a mouse that where we can knock out snapping in the beta cell to really um, see if, if we obliterate snapping altogether, if we can, uh, if, if insulin secretion goes away completely. So the, you know, the fundamental question there is how important is snapping in that process? Um, that's maybe, you know, clinically maybe not as relevant. Um, <coughs> The other, um, the other experiment we're doing is we're, um, we have a mouse where we can upregulate the mutant snapping, the, the good snapping. We can let the mouse grow up, we can let it become an adult, we can, uh, we can uh, put it on a high fat diet, we can make it diabetic, and then we can express the mutant snapping in beta cells and see if we can reverse all that that's happening. Those are fundamental, you know, questions that we have to ask before we would essentially go and say, okay, this really is a drug target. The R1 alpha is probably a true bona fide you know, drug target at this point. Um, the problem is that there's Carney's complex, so you know, uh, other tissues should not have inhibited R1 alpha. So we can't make a, we can't design a drug that would just inhibit R1 alpha. Uh, because it will cause problems in other tissues. Um, but um, the, the approach we're taking is we're trying to develop a nanoparticle that can, that can bind uh, both GI, GLP-1 and GIP receptors. And there is only one cell in the body that has receptors for both, and that's the beta cell. And we can target nanoparticles that to those cells, and we have achieved a way of reaching beta cells only. So we're actually trying to use the, you know, nature, uh, the, the density of the receptors, and only the combination of those two receptors are, is only present in beta cells to actually target those cells. Um, but that's a long-term project, and it's very, very complicated. I, I, I thought nanotechnology was easy, you know, but like Pac-Man or something, but it isn't. <laughs> Um, the other thing that we found is very, is, um, is, is more, uh, more like for the aficionados, um, and that is um, if we, if you look at this, um, where's the pyruvate thing? If we look at this, then uh, these mice, the only thing that we've changed in these mice is something in the beta cells. 
they secrete more insulin. But the interesting thing is that their gluconeogenic gene expression, their gluconeogenic gene apparatus that essentially is um, um, thought to be a result of high fat diet is, is, is under control. So they're not, their, their gluconeogenic apparatus is suppressed. And um, it, it is also, um, this is now really getting a little you know, nerdy in terms of, um, in terms of uh, metabolism and diabetes, but um, if you look at this graph here, what you see here is that baseline insulin secretion or baseline glucose is normal, even in the high fat diet situation, whereas it's high. It essentially means that, um, and the same thing is, that the insulin levels are also not higher at baseline in these months. So even in, in the fasting situation, um, so in, in humans and rodents and every, you know, every organism that becomes diabetic, fasting hyperglycemia, so the, the classical diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, um, fasting hyperglycemia is not alone a result of defective beta cell function or insulin resistance. Hepatic gluconeogenesis has to be out of control for fasting hyper hyperglycemia to occur like in these mice here. But fasting hyperglycemia does not occur in these mice. And um, I don't have the slide here, but the insulin levels are not different between uh, control mice and uh, these mice. So it's not high insulin that's keeping the uh, gluconeogenesis uh, in check. It's somehow the um, dynamic insulin response, the amplified insulin response to uh, glucose. So that it's not how much insulin is secreted, it's how it's secreted. Uh, seems to matter in terms of controlling gluconeogenesis. Um, so we are, you know, essentially we have to start looking at the liver a bit more carefully and, and trying to figure out what's actually, what, what is actually happening in the liver. Is it gene expression? Is it you know, substrate flux? Is pyruvate just going somewhere else and not to glucose? But we don't know. Diabetes is probably one of the best studied diseases with regards to GMY association. Is there any reason to suggest So genome-wide association studies for diabetes have been um, somewhat disappointing that it's maybe 5% of diabetes is explained by SNPs, by polymorphisms. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, like you said, it's, it's, it's very widely um, studied, but the 95% of the type 2 diabetics don't fall into a category uh, where these SNPs actually, these findings of the SNPs actually to, uh, um, to indicate like a, you know, a group or a group of genes or at least a pathway that would, uh, that, that, that would explain something. The most promising one was uh, a transcription value called TCF7. And um, you know, that, has, that, that has potential. The interesting thing about TCF7 is that it does feed into the empathy pathway. So it's responsive to the signal. It, uh, it also regulates infant hormone or, or pro-glucophone gene expression in the 